staying stuck in the aggressor role would, is also a possibility, or um, making extreme efforts to be a rescuer, always taking care of other people, not out of generosity necessarily, but out of a uh, uh, driven sense of trying to undo what happened to it. If I can just be good enough, long enough, hard enough, perfectly enough, I can somehow undo the bad that's happened to me. So staying stuck in those extreme roles. An inability to tolerate feelings or conflict, getting triggered and either shutting down or fueling feelings to the extreme would be another sign of unresolved trauma. Intense self-blame or feelings of unworthiness. Um, difficulty in relationships because you can't tolerate ambivalence. Somebody, somebody is okay and maybe even idealized with you, but then they mess up and now they're all bad. It, the, the inability to handle the whole truth of who somebody is or who they are themselves. Um, if I'm not perfect, then I'm not, I'm not worth anything. If I'm not worth, if I have um, any faults at all, then I have no worth. Um, black and white thinking or other kinds of cognitive distortions, which makes a lot of sense. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. How um, trauma survivors are real prone to cognitive distortions, messy thinking because they were in a situation that they had that was unthinkable, and they had to figure out how to think about it, um, how to make sense of it, and you're going to come up with some distorted thinking, especially if you're young and a child. Um, suicide, suicidal thoughts, suicidal gestures would be another example, and then also pathological dissociation, which simply means leaving your mind, leaving your body present, and taking your mind somewhere else, disconnecting. It's not unusual for trauma survivors to lose time. And if you think about it, um, that makes sense because if you have been in, in a situation that's beyond understanding, it was actually a coping strategy to disconnect and leave your body there and take your mind somewhere else as a way of surviving what was happening to you. And then in the future, if you get triggered, you have to do the same thing in those situations that may be perfectly safe, but they're somehow reminiscent of that awful time. And another thing that's common to trauma survivors is um, using psychobabble is what we call comorbidity, which means multiple diagnoses. Um, they may need criteria for a lot of different psychological diagnoses. We that focus on trauma um, call them trauma survivors rather than you know, having depression, having anxiety dealing with the diagnosis label. Let's talk about why these injuries go so deep um, and why it's so difficult to recover from them. What's in play here? Yeah. Want to help us to engage maybe um, in a different way than simply thinking about Burundi or Rwanda? Um, that what we're talking about is any kind of trauma. And so we're talking about what happens, you know, down the street when a child's living in an alcoholic home. We're talking about what happens down the street when someone's living in a house where there's abuse. Um, this fall, we're going to New Orleans and we're going to be working with people after Katrina, okay? So it's not just, gosh, that awful thing that happened in Rwanda and us trying to imagine what they went through. This is, this is all around us. And alongside that, when we were in Rwanda, we weren't just dealing with the trauma they went through with the genocide. They have alcoholism. They have suicidality. They have spousal abuse. So there's all the trauma, kinds of trauma that we're familiar with in our own culture. Good point. So it's not just the big, bad genocide. Could you talk just a little louder, please? I will try. I'll also come closer to you. Can you back there hear me? I try to project, but that's a common with me. But you can't hear me. What happens when you're hurt, whether you're an adult or a child, is it puts at conflict two primary urges. One is the urge to be connected, to be in relationship, to be attached. Okay? And the other is the urge to recoil in the face of harm. In health, 
these two urges, we, we all dance with them. Um, if, we're in, if we are meeting somebody, we may take a step toward them if things are going well, and that step toward them may be actually physically toward them or making ourselves available for relationship. If it feels safe, we move a little closer. We share a little bit more about ourselves. If it still feels safe, we take another step forward. But if, if they start giving us something we're not comfortable with, we step back a little bit. Or if in the most extreme somebody were to threaten us with physical violence, we don't just step back a little bit. We're out of there, hopefully. Okay. So there's this appropriate dance that happens. What's true with um, trauma, however, at least after the fact, is when a child's hurt, it imposes a profound, profound dilemma. And a child is going to resolve that dilemma by opting to honor attachment. And the reason for that is when you're a child, you have to maintain attachment in order to get your basic needs met that are going to allow you to stay alive. You have to have food, clothing, and shelter. And for a child, even if it's someone peripheral to the primary people that are take, supposed to take care of them, those people have either, they're either the ones that are hurting them or they're the ones that have failed to protect them. And so it's going to, for, for the child, feel like that primary relationship has been compromised if they don't do whatever they can to, to stay in attachment with them. So when a child is hurt, they either opt to protect that attachment relationship or if that's simply not available to them any longer, they're going to collapse psychologically. And that's what we saw with genocide. The children would, um, if, if everybody that was ordinarily available to take care of them is now gone, a lot of them did collapse. Okay? Um, or you wind up with things like children taking care of children, or children being exploited by um, exploitive adults. Okay. With adults, it's a little bit different. Adults are going to go one way or the other. They're either going to opt to, for attachment and, and maintaining that, or they're going to recoil. One of, in either one of them, in extreme. Um, they're, going to organ they're going to establish safety rules for their relationships in the extreme, dependent on their temperament. If someone tends to be assertive, maybe aggressive if they're pushed, they're going to opt to go into the recoil category. And they're going to um, deflect attention by either uh, disappearing or you know, making themselves invisible, or they're going to do it by being bristly and prickly and holding people at a distance that way. Or their safety rules may be, I, the only way I can keep myself safe is to always be in relationships. So I'm going to always accommodate, I'm going to earn my key, I'm going to make myself indispensable. For both children and adults, these safety rules get articulated in the extreme. And they, they drive their lives, especially in triggering situations. In the original context, those rules may be highly functional. If you're in a situation, if you give your opinion, somebody smacks you, it's, it's not dysfunctional, it's not unhealthy to decide, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. But if you start generalizing that to anything that in any way reminds you of that original traumatic situation, and you always keep your mouth shut, that's no longer helpful, it's no longer healthy, it becomes problematic. So the very thing that originally kept you safe now is what is the setup for hurting you. I'm looking at my notes here. The relevance to genocide. With the genocide, there was a whole generation of children where their primary attachments were compromised. Their parents were either killed or their parents were in a situation where they were um, viewed critically by the larger culture. Um, and then after the genocide, um, if their parents had been on the side of the people who were committing the genocide, they were at risk of being incarcerated. And so there was a threat to all of those, um, those relationships for the children. For both children and adults, assumptions about um, safety rules, assumptions about trust in relationships no longer apply. Life had dealt them a situation that put all of that at question. And um, so those no longer worked for them. 
uh, adults were desperate to not feel their feelings, and so you have large incidents of alcoholism, you have a lot of spousal abuse. Um, it played out in all of the ways that we can imagine in our own culture. One of the more touching moments for me, um, when we were doing a training with the medical people and the teachers, there was a young man who approached me on a break and he was telling me about um, that his fiance had recently broken up with him. And one of the things that he'd come out of the um, genocide with was uh, a belief that he was only safe if he uh, never complained about anything, if he didn't share his feelings. So anytime he and his fiance would have a conflict, he would clam up and, and pull away from her. And, and sounds very familiar. I mean, he could have been my own kid. You know? But here, here was a man whose anguish right now was on, a, on a, the big scale, relatively ordinary. But this had impacted his capacity to make relationship in the most ordinary of ways. And he was so sad, saying, if I had only known what you folks had been talking about, maybe I could have learned to share my feelings with her, and I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And part of what was so touching to me is that when people quit chasing you around with weapons and threatening your life, what your main concerns are, are the ordinary things of life, to be lovable and to be loved. So that was very touching. Um, when we talk about attachment ambivalence, um, having um, a real, uh, on the one hand, wanting to be in a relationship and on the other hand, being afraid to, I think of reading The Strength That Remains and how Deo demonstrated this over and over again. And I have never met him, so I'm only speaking about from what I've read in the book and assuming that it's accurate. There were times where he wanted to talk um, openly about what had happened. Uh, apparently was quite driven with the need to talk and then just as quickly would shut off and um, not be available for that at all. Or you'd also see vacillation. When they were in Burundi, um, he would want to travel to these sites um, and revisit them, which provoked all of his feelings, and then all of a sudden he was flooded and shut down and needed to get out of there. And so you would see that um, approach avoidance, the, the need to attach, to connect, and then the need to pull away, played out. What we also know is true about trauma survivors is all of them are very driven, um, at least in triggering situations, to avoid their feelings. And this is totally understandable. They needed to disconnect from their feelings to survive. Um, I think, have any of you read Immaculate's book, um, <coughs> Left to Tell? Immaculate's a young woman from, from Luanda who visited here um, last spring, I believe, about a year ago now. Um, and she talked about in order to survive those 91 days in a room with seven other people, so small that none of them, they couldn't all sit down at the same time, she lost whole days to prayer where she literally totally disconnected from her feelings and the vehicle she used for that was prayer. Um, in psychological terms, we talk about that as dissociation. She left her body present, but her mind was somewhere else. It was a survival strategy in the context of what was going on for her. Uh, Dale, I think, um, as described when he encountered the nursing baby who was with the dead mother, um, and then he would think about that and he would quickly move away from that again. An example of something so horrific, he had to disconnect from his feelings. All those days he wandered around in that camp, um, hoping to not be detected as a Tutsi in the midst of Hutus when he was in Batari, remember that? Certainly had to disconnect from his <coughs> in order to survive that. So in the original context, a totally healthy strategy. Also needed to disconnect to stay, um, they needed to disconnect to stay in contact with people who have hurt them. Um, in Rwanda, um, people still today are um, in proximity with people who, if not them, their family member may have been the very person who killed their parents or their loved ones. Um, and in order to do that, they need to disconnect from what they are feeling. Um, all over Rwanda, there are all kinds of things that would be triggering for people. Um, would prompt them to remember what happened. There are genocide memorials all over the place. Um, there are uh, scars from...